Yeah. I'm excited. This is such an interesting topic, a very hot topic, lots of investment, lots of interest. But can it make a real difference? Can it really help operations? It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm Henry Gordon Smith, and let me introduce our panelists. We've got the CEO of Source Ag, Rianne Common. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Good. Thanks hydrating. For us. That's hydrating. awesome. Can important. you tell the audience who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name is Rina, one of the two co founders of Source. Um, I have the pleasure to run the company. Um, spent about a decade building software AI systems for large companies, airlines, steel companies, and about three years ago co founded Source to bring AI to uh, horticulture. Uh, and we'll tell a little bit more about Source and what we try to do in a second. But uh, at least want to highlight that we're super proud to be working with amazing growers uh, across the globe, but started with Harvest House. Uh, and uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Not just AI, but specifically how do you work together with growers to build AI. More cooperation happening For here sure. at Green Tech. Uh, Yelta, tell us about uh, Harvest House. Yeah, Harvest House is a uh, cooperative uh, with uh, good uh, <laughs> <laughs> tomatoes. Uh, our, uh, our growers produce tomatoes, bell peppers, and cucumbers. And Harvest House is the marketing and sales organization. How many growers? We have uh, 72 members uh, and they uh, produce for uh, 42 uh, companies. How many of them are using AI? All of them. All of them? Yeah, we started uh, three years ago, but Reen uh, will explain it, uh, uh, working uh, together. And um, uh, we started with two uh, the first year and the next year uh, it were uh, 17. And now everybody is uh, working with uh, the two because we believe that it's uh, the data and the quality of data is very important, and the quantity of data is very important to, uh, to improve it, uh, the situation. Great. Well, I have an easy question here for you, which was one of the first ones, which is why are greenhouses crucial for accelerating the access to healthy, nutritious, and delicious food? Yeah, the, the, the glass houses is, is, is at, I say always, we have no gold, we have diamonds in our hands because uh, you can uh, create an, an atmosphere uh, and you can uh, produce on a very sustainable way. And um, we have an, a, a few things we have to improve in the, in the next years. But uh, if we improve, and it's uh, CO2 and uh, uh, chemical uh, crop protection, and I think that's uh, possible. Uh, uh, then we have really, really uh, uh, diamonds in, in, in our hands. And, and, and I, I was thinking, so first I want to, Yelt is one of the most, I think, modest people I, 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 given what he's doing. So I, one thing that really sort of amazed me is, I mean, he's talking about the amount of growers and, and but Harvest House uh, grows food on uh, 1,100 hectares. Yeah. If you look at sort of average demand of the produce they grow, the growers that are under Harvest House feed, you know, 70, 80 million consumers. <clears throat> 70, 80 million consumers every year. And th this is production at scale, climate resilient, resource efficient, uh, on one of the largest scales probably in, in, in the world. And Yelt is leading an amazing group of growers, uh, probably one of the largest companies in the world if you look at sort of production. And what we did, and I wonder if that fit into the program, Henry, is we prepared some, a little bit of a presentation to, to explain a little bit what Harvest House is doing and Source. You're breaking the rules. I know, man. Well, let's hear the presentation. Should we do it? Yeah? Yes. Cool. Yes. Um, so, uh, Yelt and I prepped a little bit in the beginning because we have we want to have a discussion together on, on AI and how we collaborate, but we figured it's important to set a little bit of the context of the stage, both what a grower does, what a cooperative does, and, and how AI fits in. Um, I have to mention, we're talking about Harvest House today, but we're doing this together with Growers United as well, one of the other large co-ops in the Netherlands, and, and as a trio, we're developing this. Um, Yelte, you shared a few slides on, on Harvest House as well. Um, yes, I, I, you asked me already and I explained and you can see it here. We have uh, 72 uh, members. Uh, we are focused on salads, tomatoes, uh, cucumbers and uh, bell peppers. Uh, we like focus uh, and uh, we produce on uh, uh, more than 1100 uh, hectares uh, in the Netherlands, but also in France, Portugal, uh, England, uh, Tunisia, Morocco uh, and in Egypt. And, um, uh, so uh, we want uh, to produce uh, everywhere in Europe in the, in the coming, uh, coming years. 
Um, and the next uh, slide, um, uh, the co-op uh, has uh, 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 a lot of uh, 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 companies, uh, marketing and sales companies. We like to, uh, uh, to make uh, the product mark combinations uh, for, uh, for the company so that everybody knows what he has to do. TNI is the biggest of, uh, of our uh, group. He's uh, focused on the retail in uh, Germany, uh, the Netherlands and the United uh, Kingdom. And uh, the newest one, and I'm, I'm very proud of it, is uh, Food Fellows. Uh, we have a uh, lot of rest uh, stroma, I don't know the correct word, but uh, uh, tomatoes in the package houses we can sell to the market. Uh, we make uh, uh, now for three years uh, sauces, uh, soups uh, of it, and we sell it. It was a long way uh, to go. And uh, last week was an, of last month was a very special month for us with Food Fellows because it was the first uh, month uh, uh, with no uh, loss of money. So uh, we, uh, <laughs> we we are through it because yeah, nice. it's very difficult. But that's Harvest House. Um, we work a lot together with our growers. That's the most important: working together and to achieve uh, the goals do you want. The first focus was marketing and sales, and uh, till four years we are so focused on our R and D. And uh, the first step we make was, uh, yeah, with uh, the, the source uh, uh, men, we, we started with two, Reen and Ernst, we to did. start with uh, AI software building for uh, glass houses. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you more or less explained the whole movie that you, you added. <laughs> you were as verbatim and told the movie that's also included. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> don't, 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 could, don't do could, the movie. We, 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 go, do we go on. The, all right, all right. The, the story of source is more important. Sure. Oui. Uh, yeah. Let's let's see. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, all right. So we have like we prepped like five minutes to put a bit of context, and the reason we added that is AI is such a big container uh, word, and it's such a buzz, and there's so many facets to it that we wanted to narrow down a little bit to what do we mean with AI, specifically in the context of growing food and being a grower. And um, I'm not sure if a lot of people realize this, but if we talk about fresh produce, fresh produce market globally is bigger than the whole cereal market combined, rice, wheat, grain, all of it combined, it's even bigger than the whole meat market. right? And this is the future. We're shifting to this kind of, of foods. But and this is why it's so important what we're doing in this conference. There is 3 billion people that don't have access to sufficient fresh produce. Right? The, the future is here. Look around. But it's unevenly distributed. And this is, I think, what drives us both, is how can we change that? Now, what you see is there's been no increase in production hectares of open field production in fresh produce. And so the only real option to expand supply is to move indoor. And there we need a lot of innovation, as you see on this, uh, on this uh, conference. And as Yelta knows, you know, there's a, a very strong proven solution to bring fresh produce to more regions, which is greenhouse agriculture. High tech, which is very prominent in, in Europe, but even low tech and mid tech is a very cost efficient, a very resource efficient way to grow fresh produce. But what we don't talk about a lot, and this is where Yelta is leading his company, is you know, these are massively technology advanced uh, 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 facilities, but the core of it is that it, it really is a craft to operate these things. You know, think about a Formula One car or an, an aircraft, technology very advanced. But there's a craftsman there that's driving this, this facility to gain maximum, maximum yield, maximum production, maximum quality. And this, this craftsman is one challenge, but as you know, the world's getting more complex. And what we believe is that AI plays a crucial role in scaling up greenhouse production globally. But there's a big but. Right? This is not about the autonomous greenhouse. What it's about is how do we empower this craftsman to be their best every single day. And these are the discussions we're having with the growers. It's not about replacing growers. How do you use AI to empower growers to be their best? And this is what we wanted to peel off a little bit so we can structure the discussion. You know, AI can help companies with monitoring, smart sensors, vision. It can help with execution, robotics, etc. What we talk about a lot is how can we help with decision making? How do I make sure I make the right decision at the right time? Now, in a lot of companies, you see advancements, right? You have sensors in the sky, uh, satellites that help deal with uh, uh, natural events. You have decision support systems yourself about helping you decide which route to take. You have AI systems that execute tasks for you autonomously. 
This is all AI. For growers, AI will do the same. It will help with monitoring what's the state of my crop at every single moment. It will help with decision making. Should I make it warmer, colder? When should I change my pruning strategy? And it can help with execution, with robotics, and even climate control is a form of autonomous execution of what you want to do. And what we talk about a lot, and what we'd love to talk about today, also in terms of AI, is how can you use AI for decision support, making smarter decisions. And if we look at growers, growers really are, and this is the craftsmanship of it, growers are three-dimensional chess masters. A tomato crop lives for a full year. Decisions I make today impact my whole season, and every day I make crucial decisions on climate, temperature, irrigation, nutrition, pruning strategies. And so a grower in itself is already a craftsman that's really impressive. But what if, you know, just like an aircraft pilot, what if he is surrounded by a support system that helps him be the best every single day? Uh, this is what we work on together. How do we build these systems? And now we get to sort of the, the core AI of what Source builds. What we build is a way to simulate how the biology of specific seed varieties, gene varieties, react to different growing strategies. What happens to a specific tomato variety if I make it warmer, colder, if I change my pruning strategy? And that means we can run different ways of growing crops over and over and over in a simulated environment so that the grower doesn't have to do it real life and first get to an optimum. The analogy we talked about today is Formula One. They have a virtual representation of a car. They try different strategies in that virtual representation. If something works, they do it in real life. And so in doing this, we can find optimal cultivation strategies, but we can also simulate the output of different strategies. For instance, if I change my strategy, what will happen with my production? How many kilograms can I expect? Two, four, eight weeks into the future. What will be my fruit specs? What will be the weight of my tomato? For a sales organization, extremely valuable also to create efficiency across the chain, right? to have more efficiency, less food waste, better optimization. So to wrap up, this is why we believe, and we'd love to talk about that, is it's not about how AI can empower growers or replace growers. It's about empowerment. And then it's about where do we empower growers? Monitoring, deciding, execution. And we think if you do this well and you collaborate, what you end up with is an ability to empower growers to reduce risks, to expand production, to realize better returns. And in the end, this all adds up to our ability to accelerate access to healthy, fresh produce across the globe. And this is, in the end, what drives us to collaborate and build this technology. Great. I think you covered a lot there. And very good presentation, so thank you for that. How did your collaboration begin? It started, um, I think, three years ago, uh, Rien, and um, one of our growers was, uh, 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 was meeting uh, Rien and Ernst, and, um, and he, he called me and he said to me, uh, uh, I met uh, two guys, uh, I was really impressive, but I don't know what we can do with it. Do, do you want to talk with it? And I met them and I, I thought, yes, th this is it. Uh, data is so important for us, but the crows were always saying, yeah, we are craftsmen and, and, and we don't need uh, data, it is not necessary. But um, yeah, they uh, approved of, yeah, they, they, uh, uh, they did it uh, other than others we met before. And uh, so we started uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a presentation and, uh, uh, and with all our growers and uh, a lot of they said, no, no, this, this is not the future. <laughs> but I was very happy the two uh, largest uh, growers of us, one bell pepper and one tomato grower said, okay, we go for it. And um, they started with nothing. And uh, after a year, there was, an, uh, yeah, there was already a an, 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 an platform and a deciding uh, a schedule, and we show it to the other growers. And to, uh, at that moment, all the other growers said, OK, now we understand what we are doing and what we're, what's happening. And that's the, the moment all the growers of, um, of Harvest House and Growers United uh, joined the working yeah. together uh, situation. And, uh, and that, was the, that was the start. And uh, then. Uh, they got with, you started with two and then yeah. uh, you grow very fast. You yeah. Can, yeah. 80, 80 people now. Yeah. yeah. But the first meeting with uh, Kees van Veen from Agrocare, yeah. that, that started like, uh, we presented what we wanted to do and the reaction was more or less like, uh, yeah. 
who the hell are you to yeah. uh, it took it took some time to uh, uh, to took, convince them I think. it took uh, uh, for certain uh, uh, a time but uh, no. now everybody uh, knows what's what's possible and now we're going faster and faster that's uh, that's so important and yeah. and yeah the, the 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 first achievements are very good yeah yeah, it's very interesting that you have to sort of find a few champion growers that are going to take the risk and then others follow. We hear yeah. that a lot in yeah. the adoption of ag tech in general. So it's nice to hear that that is at least another proven way to get things going is who yeah. are those growers that are going to give it a try and then inspire the others to follow. Yeah. Um, you talked about decision making. So I, I want to know from these operators, what are the decisions that they're making most often with AI? I think... Uh, you understand his English is much better than mine, so you can better explain the, the last bird. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so so the, what, what we see is there are sort of two horizons of decision making. One is more strategic for the season. So I'll give you one example. As a tomato grower, you're trying to, almost like a bonsai tree master, make decisions on how you prune your plant that fits well with the local radiation pattern of the sun. And so one decision you have to make is at which moment in the year, which week, do I change the amount of um, uh, tomatoes that I leave on a truss early on when there's still little flowers? How many do I cut away, pruning? And the more you leave on, the more of a source, the more of a sink, the more of a, it, it sucks energy from the plant. And so you can steer that. And these are strategic decisions you make as a grower. In which week do I change my pruning strategy that will really determine how it grows the rest of the season? So there, there we help by simulating that season. Some other decisions are less on sort of the full season horizon, but much more on the 24 hour, 48 hours into the future. And one that we indeed discussed this morning is, as a grower, every day you have to decide at which moment in the day do I give my final irrigation shot, they call it. So what's the last time in the day that I give my plant water? How many cc's to achieve the right dry down to so the amount of, of uh, moisture in the root zone? that it drops a bit during the night, that, that's good for the plant, it, it creates room for oxygen, it's good for the health of the plant. Uh, you have to make that decision every single day. This is also something where AI can support growers in finding that. And you find that your customers are doing both things? They're using both those, both those horizons? What's the most common use? Because yeah. there must be some things they're not doing, they're not using. Or are they using every single feature you provide? Yeah, we don't really look at it as uh, we build one thing and then uh, it's done, or they use it or not. Um, for me, there's, there's really no end point to this. So we started about two years ago. One of the things we realized is there's a lot of data already available in the greenhouse, um, a lot on climate and irrigation, a bit less on plants, on, on the state of the crop. So what we developed together is first a good data platform where we collect all of that data, there was an iterative process, it's never done. And then in parallel, we use that data to train the algorithms that support on that long-term and short-term decision-making. Uh, and that's a sort of step-by-step -step thing. So that, for instance, the, the irrigation one that I mentioned, is being used in Kwekerai Wieringemeer up north. Um, we're running a beta there. Uh, and uh, that's now only focused on the last shot but we're going to expand it over time with them. So it's, a, it's an iterative process where we try something, they give feedback, they, growers are known to give <laughs> pretty straight feedback, yeah. I would say, but it's yeah. good because we can learn from that. Yeah. And Yelta, I mean, the growers have other technologies, other climate systems, other software they use before that. So what, what's different for them now? Are they using a single software? What does it look like? Or no, they use the software they used to uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the glass house. And uh, yeah, we couple the things to, uh, to source. And uh, the first was the climate uh, computers, uh, I think. Yeah. And with Hogendoor and Ridder, Priva, we all uh, have uh, good discussions. And uh, it's possible to have the, 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 the climate computer and source uh, interact uh, each other. API, and so, yeah. And so we go, yeah, yeah, with the API, and we go on and go on. So it's not a change of uh, that uh, situation. Uh, uh, we want to collect the data and do uh, good things with it. That's it. Yeah. OK, very interesting. And any problems like with the growers' adoption? I mean, you're saying they're giving feedback. What kind of feedback are they giving you that's negative? Yeah, the biggest, the, the, the biggest uh, negative thing we, uh, we have is uh, the, 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 the tempo. 
because uh, first to uh, make the growers uh, happy that we can do that or that they understand that it's uh, important now they are all there they're not waiting they're, you you must faster Reen, you For must sure. faster you must faster yeah. so the, the the biggest problem is now to scale <laughs> up and uh, keep the tempo uh, so fast so yeah three years ago he was talking about plants i was three years ago he does, doesn't understand nothing about plants so in three years times from zero to 80 people working in Amsterdam for uh, building software and, and, and this, this kind of things is beautiful. But now we are uh, uh, running, we want faster, faster, faster. Yeah. So that's our biggest problem. Ne never so fast the, the struggle is you can't catch up with the needs of the growers because they want, like, I I just, it's not specific enough. Like, what yeah, I'll, I'll give you an example. So for instance, um, we first built an iPad app and the whole platform to register data for tomatoes. Um, we give feedback to the grower every day on the state of the crop on multiple dimensions. Uh, but we also have pepper growers in Harvest House. So once we were there, of course, the pepper growers say, okay, this is great. Now we want this. Why is it taking so long? Why can't we have this tomorrow? Uh, but if you build software, some things take some time. Like you want to make sure security is right, scalability is right, all of that stuff. And then once you've built it, you can show them 10 things on the plant. And then, of course, the feedback is, well, we want to see five more things. And I honestly don't see it as negative. I see it as positive if people give, give constructive feedback, even if growers are known to be pretty rough around the edges. I'm much more worried if people don't talk to us anymore. Right? Then, then engagement is gone. But as long as people want more and give us feedback and like, why is this different and the definition of whatever X, Y, Z should be different, I think it's fine. We just need to... Honestly, I think as a technology provider, our role is to listen, to really understand the workflow of growers, and then with our product teams, translate that to what is the best thing we can build for them, build it, test it, get feedback, and do that over and over again. And like, what are the actual results? What are the metrics of, of improvement that you're seeing? I'm sorry? The metrics of improvement, are we seeing increase in profit? Are we seeing decrease in labor? Are we seeing decrease in loss of product? What are the, the final results that we're benefiting from AI across your cooperative? I think uh, uh, production, uh, quality of uh, the, the production. And yeah, if you start with data, then the, 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 the possibilities are, are, are so much. So uh, labor, uh, uh, what's, what's, what's happening? And the most important for, uh, for us as co-op is uh, yeah, Ambul prognosis. Uh, yield production. Yield production. Uh, uh, the yield production, and now at the moment, uh, we get a yield production of our growth of 14 days. But with, uh, uh, with the data and AI, it's possible to have it in four weeks or eight weeks uh, before with a uh, uh, reliable uh, uh, presentation of uh, 90, 99%. It must happen what we can, how we can improve the, 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 the chain with, uh, with, uh, with our customers. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, you're saying you've increased the length and horizon for the yield predictions, and then also it's 99% accurate. <laughs> I'm yeah. not signing off on that number. I was like, that's pretty crazy. I'm not signing off on that number. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we, have, yeah. we are extending the horizon to four, six, seven weeks. Uh, there is some systemic uncertainty, which you can never do. Weather, right? We cannot predict the weather better. Uh, but we're very confident that we can get to the right accuracy even yeah. four or, or six weeks out. That helps them improve their yield forecast. Any more at the moment, we, we don't, we I'll don't give you have a nice one. I want I'll some numbers. Nice they yeah, want yeah. the numbers, right? I'll give you a nice one. So this is uh, a little bit fresh off the press, but we did some first analysis on that short-term decision-making. Uh, right, so when do I give the final shot of the day to get the right irrigation? What we see across the whole growers is that it's very tough to get it right. So about 50% of the nights, growers get it off target. And not a little bit, uh, quite a bit. Um, with the, uh, the, 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 the work we're doing with Kwekerai Bieringemeer, where we run the autonomous uh, uh, dry down uh, steering, uh, what we see now is that we're 95% on target. But this is a big change, right? It means like half of the nights we're off to more or less yeah. every night we have the perfect irrigation decision. Yeah. And, and this, this is what makes You have guessing to strategy. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly, exactly. But there's still, any there's other? still a grower any in other? the loop. Yeah, there's still the grower making that decision. Yeah. But and any other things? Labor, water, what else are we saving on? Yeah, so what we see is there's a couple of different use cases how this is being used. Um, with source track, it's really about visibility. 
if you're a grower, it's not so much about making that single perfect decision. It's also about making sure you don't make big decisions. And with source track, we give growers feedback on what are all the metrics on climate irrigation, the plant, and where should you course correct. And we see that growers get much faster feedback. So one use case that we put online also, it's on our website, is that because there's such quick feedback on where you need to course correct, the grower that we work with has a 10% increase in yield because he just makes all the right decisions, get faster feedback. Yeah. Some other growers use it like AgroCare. They want to scale up massively, but they can't find sufficient growers to man all of those new facilities. So it's much less about yield increase. It's much more about the ability to control not one, but two greenhouses with the same grower. So, you know, everybody has a different way they use it, but it all adds up to having the right information at the right time, getting support on the right decisions, yeah. and then using that in sales or in scaling up or reducing risk or training junior growers, whatever the, the business objective is. And so speaking of like the right information, there's all kinds of sensors and technologies that are pretty ubiquitous in, in high-tech greenhouses or Dutch greenhouses. But what are some of the new technologies that are gonna give more data to feed into these AI tools for decision-making that you're excited about? Yeah. I have for sure have an opinion, but maybe I'm, you know. I'm a marketing and sales man. So. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more a question for you. Like, like, like okay. machine vision is being yeah. talked about yeah, yeah. all the time, right? We talked about the previous yeah. panel too, like looking at the plant from the outside, seeing what's happening. Yes. What, what, what tech are you excited about? What hardware sensors are you excited about? Yeah, mainly around the plant, I, I should say. Like seeing what the plant is, is knowing what the plant is feeling from another direction. Again, I think there's the, the, the same two horizons are relevant. Uh, there's some very interesting dimension, uh, innovations on short-term, plant stress, for instance, yeah. which is much more intraday, like what does the plant experience intraday. Um, but on the long horizon, there's um, roughly 40, 50 parameters that we want to understand on the crop. Things like head thickness, amount of flowers, the coloring of tomatoes, the size of tomatoes, the number of leaves. There's about 40, 50 parameters that give you a a good representation of the state of the crop. And this is, I think, if we talk about digital twins, it's very tempting to think about a camera. But if I make a digital twin uh, of, of you, um, if I'm a clothing company, I might like sort of a 3D scan so I can try you know, different clothings on you. But if I'm a doctor, for me, a digital twin doesn't mean that. It means maybe a table with your temperature and your weight and I don't know. So for us, the digital twin of the crop means having those 40, 50 parameters digitized, easy access. And I see very interesting uh, innovations in vision specifically on identifying some of those. I think we're not there with the silver bullet where there's one solution that measures all of those 50 perfectly every single day. We've solved that for now together by building a simple iPad app that, that helps us get all of those 50 parameters in. But we're looking for partners and, and companies to see which one of those measurements can we automate. The challenge, I would say, to center companies developing this is don't rule out the, 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 the cost of data acquisition. So that it's te technically feasible to do something. In the end, it, it matters to the grower, do I have sufficient information to make right business decisions? And can I gather that data in the most cost efficient way? Yeah, is yeah. it affordable, whether it's yeah, the equipment exactly, or exactly. the time that you need to do it? Yes. What about sales and marketing data? Isn't that super valuable for the longer horizon we talked about? Are you bringing that data into this AI work? Yeah, we, we hope we, we started with uh, the, the, the crop, uh, the yield production, uh, but now also the sales production we, uh, we're starting in and on a lo longer term uh, because the retail in, the, in Europe is also uh, not. Uh, doing the the, the, the the goals like this of the wave like this, so we can. If it we is have, volatile, you're saying? Or uh, is it's, it? It's, it's not so. Uh, not so volatile. No, no. So if we can a, a good sales uh, uh, prediction, prediction, yeah. and then a good uh, yield prediction, and we can bring it together, then it's uh, possible to uh, improve mm -hmm. the supply yeah. chain much more much than we more. do uh, today. Yeah. 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 Very very exciting. Okay, well, I mean, we have a packed audience here. Do any of you have some questions for our amazing panelists? Just raise your hand. <laughs> there we go, young lady in the back. Uh, yeah, I have more of a, a question in relation to the genetics that are used in those different fruits or plants, or to grow them at least. Because you collaboratively work together with many different growers. I can imagine that they use different seeds from different suppliers. 
how do you make sure that the model that you're using is also taking that into account and not bringing everything into one big pile of question. data? That, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So what we realized when we started this is um, it's not like image recognition or, or uh, places where you have billions and billions of data points to find pure statistical, uh, to train the models pure on statistics. So this is why we decided to do a mix of um, pure plant scientific approach. So really understanding the causal relationships between what the plant experience and what happens. And there's different levels where this is relevant. For instance, peppers and tomatoes are both vine crops, so they have some similarity how they react. We find those signals. Uh, within tomato, we have uh, you know, tomatoes on the vine, uh, beefsteak tomatoes. There's different dynamics there. And that sort of stacks up to different seed varieties. And so what we do is, on the one hand, we have plant scientists on our, uh, that work at source from Wageningen and other universities. We do our own experiments. We look at academic literature to understand causal relationships. And then we build a hybrid model together with the growers to understand, based on historic data, who different seed varieties fit into that sort of holistic view of how crops develop. And that, I mean, our, our vision here is that even if you know, new seeds would come to market, that we wouldn't need three years of data to understand that seed, but that we could cross-find the patterns to understand roughly how that seed uh, reacts to different circumstances, and in a short time, calibrate the models to new seed varieties. That, that's our vision on this. Any other questions, please? This is the chance. I mean, this is the horticulture <laughs> CEO of uh, probably of I the mean, industry. I like, oh, sure. hectares. That's like that's, that's like, crazy. That's crazy. It's more yeah. than all of the United States, right? Yeah. Like all yeah. the greenhouses. It's in, yeah. I mean, it's not a big market there, but still. It's, still, yeah. It's, it's a big population. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. That's true. And you said some. In Africa as well, in Tunisia, you've got some others. Yeah, the, 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 uh, our focus uh, is Europe, and um, uh, the retail is uh, asking us for year-round production. So uh, we do a lot with uh, lighting in the Netherlands, but also in uh, the northern of Africa, where we can uh, do it uh, together. There's always two reasons uh, why, where we start. Uh, is it possible year-round and, uh, and, and the cost price? And the second is if it's local for local. Because we started in France uh, for a, a few years ago, uh, the French market is a very good market for French product. You get more than uh, a, a product from uh, elsewhere. So uh, it is all for local, local, and then we get a better price. Or it is for the cost price. We uh, we look where the best situation is. But you're exporting the product from Tunisia to Europe, right? In that we're case. also uh, exporting uh, uh, outside to Europe, but uh, uh, 90. 5% of our production is in an, uh, in an area of 800 kilometers of, of the Netherlands. We can drive it with one, uh, one, one truck in one day. Okay. Yeah. And I just am curious, like with the energy crisis, what, it, what was it like for your cooperative and for your growers? Yeah, it was a an, an, an difficult uh, period. Um, uh, normally, we have, as a harvest house, we have uh, uh, almost 400 uh, uh, hectares of uh, lightning. So we have uh, winter production. Uh, now, last year it was 100 uh, hectares, and uh, we, uh, the only hectares we uh, planned were the hectares where retail said, okay, I want a contract for this, uh, for this uh, price, otherwise we have none, but uh, it was uh, less. Uh, and uh, then we, w we, were, we were very happy with the Northern Africa uh, production because he was there and he was, uh, was coming. So we uh, can, uh, um, our customers are satisfied about last winter, but it was well, uh, uh, tricky because uh, Spain is there. It is our comp competitor, and uh, Spain normally in the winter is uh, uh, is, uh, is in the tomatoes not so big as uh, as, as the Netherlands. So uh, we, we were afraid that Spain will uh, pick up the market from us. Right. And uh, but yeah, the weather was helping us uh, this year. In Spain was the weather uh, not so good, so the production in whole Europe was uh, low. And now the retail is a little bit changing uh, because they want they want to be sure that they have the pro product. Not the price is more important. Now is it, do I get the product? Yeah. Mm. Uh, there we go. Nice. The courage. <laughs> uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Federico Michalian from 30 megahertz. 
Uh, I wanted to know from the AI perspective, uh, because I see the, the growers, they have very specific crops. So how difficult it is to support a new crop? So there is a new grower, they, they don't have tomatoes, peppers, they have something different. So how difficult it is to start like gr uh, giving some insights for that new crop? Like a completely new crop beyond tomato, pepper, or cucumber, yeah. Um, I won't underestimate that it's tough. Like we do see, of course, uh, for instance, melons are also vine crops. They're closer to tomatoes than uh, a potato is, right? So the, in this sort of the crop family, there's some that closer and farther away from our starting point. How our vision here is let's start with one crop. Uh, we started with tomato. Let's really understand that. It's a little bit linked to the answer I just gave, sort of on the whole range. And then from there, move sideways to additional crops. And like uh, Yelta mentioned, the you know, Harvest House has um, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers. Growers United, for instance, also has eggplants. And so, you know, we have enough to focus on for now to get us uh, there. But our whole rationale is to set up the algorithms in a way that we should be able to scale increasingly easier to new varieties the more we, we, we add to that system. Thanks. Are you looking to grow any, any melons, uh, Yeltsin? No. Or anything else? No. We could put it on a roadmap. I'm not e sure e if... Every uh, year, a <laughs> strawberry grower is asking, can oh, I really? be a member of Harvest House? And we always say, no. That, that would be focus, good. Focus, focus, focus. Yeah. Focus is key. Wow, you yeah, reject the strawberry. Why? We want focus. Strawberry is a totally different product in the, in the, in the, in the supply chain. And the marketing and sales is different. It is an other category managed by the retail. So you need a whole new team uh, 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 NAS, uh, near uh, yeah. your uh, normal team. So we say focus. And um, in the retail shell is um, uh, tomato, cucumbers, and uh, uh, bell peppers is 25 product percent of the turnover, so you are important for, uh, for the retail. So we don't need for the retail more products, and for the cost price, we uh, love focus. Good message for all of us there. One more question, yeah? Uh, first of all, thank you for your clear speech, and I have a question about the data. Uh, you make a very uh, strong emphasis on plant data and crop modeling in terms of uh, making a strategy. Uh, but I think other than crop, model, crop modeling and plant data, also climate data and uh, labor measurement data would, uh, would, should be taken account to make a strategy and make a plan. How do you think about it? Because there are a lot yes. of situations, unexpected situations happening in, in the greenhouse. Yes. Like you yeah. would expect that. But uh, like for example, uh, the products has to be harvested a like, few days uh, before I expected. Yeah. And this kind of situation, are they also taken account into the model? And are you planning to do that, or you think plant model is the most important thing and the only data that you should? Excellent question. Yeah. Um, look, it starts with the plant. You need to understand the biology of the plant because that really drives everything. But you're 100% correct. So how we look at this and actually how we build the model is if as a grower or as a company you have a strategy that you feel is optimal, what we do in the background is we don't only simulate the crop development so for different strategies, how will the crop develop, but we also simulate for that specific facility, its specific uh, uh, um, uh, uh, dynamics, what is the associated resource usage, electricity, gas, labor, down to you know, which actions are needed if you change your temperature, your uh, ripening period changes, or your growth uh, speed changes, so you need more labor for twisting, for instance. So we simulate our, all the resource requirements. And the beauty of this is it gives us, combined with price data, both on the resource side and on the market side, we can give feedback to growers not on the expected production, so kilograms, but on the expected cost, resource usage, and thus profit. And the big game changer here is that, especially with energy prices changing, it's much, it's already very hard mentally to optimize for kilograms per square meter. But if you then also want to optimize for profit, this is very often a different optimum than the kilograms. But mentally, honestly, that's humanly impossible. So this is what we do for different strategies. We simulate all of that. And as a we give feedback to the grower, 
what is the expected kilograms, but also the profit on a season level, broken down into labor, energy, all of that. And, and that makes it for a, pro, for a grower much more feasible, especially in new situations, uh, whether I go to a new climate region where I've never grown before or a new region in terms of gas prices are different, to try different strategies risk-free in a simulated environment. And then once you find the optimum, use that in the actual um, growing operation. Yeah, it's a great, great, great point. Thank you. Okay, well, let's have a nice uh, round of applause for Rianne and Yelta. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.